we're studying creation versus evolution. And we're studying the Hebrew text, like re Hebrew reading and research, but we're looking at a lot of the archaeological finds and things that go on back at, during this period of time. I've told my students for many, many years that uh, contrary to what some theologians say, theologians many times say that you, the Bible is inspired of God, but that all of the historical facts are not correct, that all of the geological facts are not correct, that all the archaeological proofs are not true in the Bible, that medical and science is not part of the inspiration of the Bible. Now, I disagree with that. I really believe the Bible is inspired thoroughly and totally. And I believe the history, the archaeology, the anthropological studies, everything is all involved in this. And I trust the Bible to be true in all of those aspects. And I try to prove that in every way I can as we study God's Word. We're in the book of Genesis, the 18th chapter and verse 6. Uh, Sharon, you have your Amplified Bible, don't you? Yes. Could you come up here and read 18.1 through 6? 18.1 through 6. Sure. I like to use the Amplified Bible because it explains things. It's redundant, but it explains things so many times. Get the page. Yeah. Now the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks or terebinths of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood at a distance from him. He ran um, from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant, I beg you. Let a little water be brought to wash your feet and recline and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel or a mouthful of bread to refresh and sustain your hearts before you go on further, for that is why you have come to your servant. And they replied, Do as you have said. So Abraham hastened to the tent of Sarah and said quickly, Get ready uh, three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. All right. So that's where we are. This is where we are in this story. This is where. And now in Hebrew it says, We moher Abram Ha'ohila El Sarai, Wyomer, Mahari, Shilosh, Siim, Kiamah, Soleth, Lushi, Waasi, Yudgoth. And he hurried and kept on hurrying. Now, what tense is this in, Sharon? Yeah, PL, 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 while consecutive and perfect. And the PL uh, tense means what? With, Ex with great force, yes. with great force and power. And he hurried. Boy, I mean, he got with it. it I mean, with all of his old able, bo able uh, ger geriatric bones, he's hurrying. Abraham, and we have the whole title of Abraham here with the hay in it. And uh, hey is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which means grace. Abraham and Sarah are saved by grace. And Abraham unto the tent, the ha ohilah, the tent, el Sarai. He goes unto Sarah's tent. And then he says, and kept on saying, Wyomer, and he says and keeps on saying, Mahari. And that means hurry up, get, get with it. In Spidey Nile, it would be in Greek, hurry up, 
in great speed. Hurry up now. And bring. And what tense is this, Sharon? What tense is that in? All right, PL, yeah, PL, imperative. Really. really forcefully, do it. Get with it right now. Shilosh, three, seim, uh, three uh, measures of meal. Fine meal. Now, what kind of meal is this? That would be flour. It would be flour. This is good food. Remember, in the old, now let's go back into archaeology. Now, the common man ate barley. And in that barley, a lot of times, they would grind this food, and there would be pieces of grit in it. And the poor men just got used to breaking their teeth off on this grit and grinding their teeth down all the time. But this here now is fine flour. This is for rich people. Now, how many people are coming? Three. Three. Three people. Okay. Uh, three uh, represents what in the Bible? Three represents what? The triuneness of the tri trinity of things, as we see, we always see three. Now here we have three persons, and they're not people, really, are they? There's at least two angels and one Jesus there in his pre-incarnate form. So we have Jehovah in his pre-incarnate form and two other angels representing. They could be Michael. And Gabriel, because angels can take form, can't they? Angels have, uh, are they, they are clothed beings. Angels are clothed. So we have three clothed beings here. And they look like men because the angels always look like men. And they're masculine gender. They're actually masculine. They have all the masculine things that masculine men have. And bring quickly three Seim, measures of meal, fine meal, fine flour. This is for uh, royal guests and need. And look at this. This is feminine, singular, cal, impaired. And need and make cakes. We have another word for this. Tortillas. What they did back then, now they could have an oven, but what happened out here on the prairies and as they were going around, they had a, um, a beaten metal pot and they would put it over a fire and it would get hot and the women would take these and they would stretch this flour out and they would throw it on this pot like this in, this, in a dome shape and they would let it and they kept moving it with probably two sticks together or sometimes even in their hands or with their fingernail and they flip it up and turn it over. They flip it up so it wouldn't burn, flip it up so it burn, burn, and then turn it over. Now these tortillas is what these guys are going to get, this bread. Today we have ambient ovens and we make bread with it. Now out there in my backyard, and I'm going to take it back to Fish Lake Valley, I have, I worked on the Cord Ranch a long time ago as a horseman. And they went out on these uh, cattle herding treks, and they took a cook with them, and the cook took a portable uh, cook stove, which wasn't anything, but, uh, and I still have it. It is bars with grates on it, a bar with grates, and this is all, most of this, it's been repaired by later stuff, but a blacksmith made this, so this is all beaten together with, by a blacksmith, and the stakes, they would flip it down. It would go flat and, and go into a chuck wagon or on a horse's back, and they would take it out and set it down. Well, probably Abraham, Sarah, had some dot vice like this that they put down where they build a fire underneath it, or they would build rocks around and whatever, and they'd put this dome over it. Now, modern ovens have an ambient temperature around them. Now, I have some Viking ovens in there that are about, like, $7,000 for those ovens today. And they are confection ovens. They blow and they do all kinds of stuff. And supposedly they get the heat ambient around whatever you're cooking, cookies or cakes or pies or bread or biscuits or whatever. Now, that's pretty good. It's a pretty good oven. But in Nevada and even out here in my backyard, I have a uh, Kalamazoo oven. 
and it's a wood burning cook stove. And in that wood burning cook stove, you have a fire over here, box about like that. And the flames go up. They heat the side of the oven on this side. They go up over the oven like that. They go down the bottom side of the oven. They go under the oven. And then they go back up the back side of the oven. And all of the oven is floating in flames. And I'm going to tell you something. That's the best ambient oven that I've ever had in my life. When Marilyn went up there with me to Nevada, I would, and she would, and we've been together 19 years now on this farm. And that Kalamazoo cook stove stood right out there by the guest house all this time all covered up and I kept begging her to let me bring it in the house because I said when I cook on it you will throw rocks at those Viking ovens or any other kind of oven you possibly can have. The first time I cooked biscuits and cooked a pie and breads and stuff in that oven up there she said we got to have one of them because those ovens down there don't cook like this. The reason why it's hot like this real hot here like this and out the bottom now, in this oven in here, the heat source is in the bottom and in the top. But it seems like the bottom always gets hotter. And when I make biscuits, I like to make them very crisp on top. But I don't want the bottoms burned. Now, up there on that ambient oven that we have there and that Kalamazoo stove, it used to be Kalamazoo direct to you because they were mail-order mail stoves. With this oven being heated like that, it evenly heats it and does not burn the bottom at all so good. They didn't have that back in Abraham today. They could, I have seen in that land ovens where they would take down, they'd have a, uh, what we call a community oven, where they would, they would build a rock oven or mud oven like this and had the fires going around it and behind it up to a smoke sack like this and they'd have to come out because these are big devices. I had one, I built one one time, but they still don't cook like that. I wouldn't, not like those stoves. But just so you'll understand, they were eating tortillas. They were eating tortillas. That's what they're doing. Like what you might call these pita bread things. What I have seen them do when they did the ancient, like this, these are extremely thin wafers, so to speak. It'll be like this. So each one of these guys had a great big tortilla about this size, maybe 18 or 20 inches across thin, but this is what, and, and we're going to find out what they put in it. Now, I ate one of these meals in Damascus, Syria in 1975. So I know what it tastes like, too. I had some of this. All right, let's go on a little bit further. 18 and verse 7. Wiel, Wiel. Habakar, Habakar, Rots, Rots. Abraham, Wayika, Ben, Bakar, Rock, Watov, Wayatan, El Hanehar, Way Mahar, La O Soth, Otho. Now, those towels there are not towels, but I guess towels. I get mixed up between Greek and Hebrew. They are soft towels. Most of the towels we saw are TH towels, not strong T towels. We have. We have a conjunction and we have a preposition in front of this. We is a conjunction, page 253. L is a preposition here. Now this word is Aleph and Lameth. Now Aleph and Lameth can mean God. But here it's a preposition. All right? Habakar. Habakar. The herd. And unto the herd. Boker. What kind of herd is this, Sharon? Uh, big animals. Big animals. Big enough to They're going to, these animals are big enough to pull a plow. Okay? He went and he probably got out to the big herd and got a young calf. A young calf, probably not a female, but a young male bull, so to speak. And he ran Abraham. Abraham's doing this. Abraham's going to go get this thing now. And he's going to get the fatted calf. Now, back during this time and in later times also, the fatted calf, um, Rebecca, the name Rebecca. 
Name Rebecca means to, to, to tie up, to halter, to tie up. Rebecca means that she was so pretty that her beauty just hogtied those that saw her. Now, the fatted calf was Rebeccaized. He was tied up in a stall so he couldn't go run around. Veal today, they take these young bull calves in these dairies and they'll send them off and you can go buy one of these or buy a calf. Sometimes they used to sell them for like $10 a piece. Now they're making veal out of them. They'll take them, they'll put them in a stall, stick their heads in a stall. They don't go anyplace. They just clean out everything that's underneath them and they, and they just force feed them all that they can feed them until they get fat and then they kill them. And this is the fatted calf. They're tied up in these little bitty stalls. And if you go to some of these places, you'll find stalls not any wider than this, and they're there because they don't want them to move. Now, how many of you ever heard of goose livers? And people used to eat goose livers. They used to take geese, and they'd put them in a cage where their, only their head stuck out. They had no exercise whatsoever, and they'd force feed. They'd open their mouth and pour food down them and make their livers get real big. And the, the, the goose would be very, very, very fat, just really fat. Children sometimes, if their mothers get too fat when they're during their gestation period, when the child is born, if the child is too fat, the child will get jaundice. It'll turn yellow because their liver can't stay up with the fat content that they have in there. The liver's not big enough. <laughs> this is medical facts. Okay, these are medical facts. This, yeah. These are medical facts. Now you do. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Okay. This is what happened. Dakota, when she was born, she had this problem. That's when I did the scientific research on this medical research on it. The child is born too big, and the liver can't stay up with it, and they jaundice. So these geese and ducks that they do this to are jaundiced, and their livers get really big. And this little, now let's look and see what it says here about this fatted calf. And he took a son, remember I told you it was a little bull calf. Now remember also, we're going to cover into a lot of things, the law of Moses. Now, we don't have the law of Moses now. We have the, the law of Kamarabi and Hammurabi, don't we? Okay? We have the laws here in the land, and uh, the, the, the law of God was similar to, but did not relate to, nor did it evolve from the law of Kamarabi. Okay? It didn't evolve from it. God made laws. Now, these laws were rational laws. But in the law of Moses, if you'll see a, a dog, a cat, a bull, a calf, a ram, any of these, you could not neuter them. It was forbidden to neuter them because they had a right to procreate. And that's what God, God is, God is a person of animal rights. Uh, you animal rights haters out there, <laughs> you may not like what I just said about it. Just go check it out. The animals had a right to procreate. They could not neuter them. So this is a bull calf now, a bull calf. The son of the herd of the cattle. This is the big cattle. And then it says knock. Knock means the fatted calf. The fatted calf that was probably tied up. Tender. We told, a watov. Tender and good. And he gave... Why a ten? And he gave unto a youth, a tender young person, ha naar, ha naar, a youth. It means be tender. It means not very old. It doesn't mean some old hard old man. I remember Maryland when we were up in Nevada. We had a lion walk down our our creek and left big lion tracks like that. And she went down there, and she was so scared that she didn't want, to go, want me to go down and preach on the creek anymore without me carrying a Colt pistol or a rifle or something down there. It reminded me of the first uh, Baptist church 
in uh, California, and uh, the pastor there had a Winchester rifle across the pulpit and a Colt pistol stuck in his belt as I saw that. And uh, that one, that one, El Monte is where it was in El Monte, about 1850. And why did he have to go to preach in a pulpit with a Winchester rifle across it and a Colt pistol in his belt? Because the Catholic Church did not want any Baptist in California. This is Catholic land. Like Mary's land, Maryland. That's Catholic territory. All of the states and all of the states, basically, at one time, well, there's, even with the, uh, the Bill of Rights, they didn't have freedom of religion. Baptists had to fight to go and build churches. And we'll study that in church history later. And I'm going off on a lot of, of different little trails here, but maybe it makes it more interesting even. Uh, a son, so we have a bull calf. And he's uh, been tied up probably, so he'd be tender, so he won't run around and, and build up these muscles. He want him to be the fatted calf. And he gave unto a young and tender youth a boy that was young, a boy that is not yet gone to adolescence and big. He's a young boy. And he hurried to prepare it, him, literally. So now this calf is going to be killed. Wayeka, Hima, we hello. That's a V at the end. We hello. And Yuvan, Hab Bakar, Ah Shir, Asal, Wayatin, Lifnehem, Wehu. Omed, Alehem, Chachtha, Tachath, Haetz, Wayokilu. And he took and kept on taking yogurt. Yogurt. Now we have clabber. This is clabber. This means to coagulate. This is milk that's clavered, and this is probably camel's milk. And as you study the life of the nomads and these people that lived back there, these tent, these people of the grass, so to speak, that followed the grass, you'll find that they had great cattle herds. And when uh, Abraham's riches are mentioned, he has all of these camels and cows. Now, they milked more camels than they did cows. The camels, most people, when they rode a camel, they rode a female camel. A stallion camel is a very vicious creature. And they have teeth, fangs, and they bite each other. And a uh, llama is of the camel family. Now, the llamas and their four in their neck and in their legs and their shoulders and stuff like that, their, their ve blood vessels are very deep in their body. Now, God made it this way. It didn't evolve this way. I'm just telling you a little bit of physical science here and, and um, the study of animals. You know why their, their veins are real deep in their body? Because they fight. They fight and they lacerate each other with these fangs that they have. They're very powerful and they can strike you in any angle. They're very vicious animals. To be a camel herder, you had to be a tough old boy. It's worse than having wild mustangs because these guys are even more dangerous than wild mustangs. Or wild bulls. A camel, a stallion camel, uh, Muhammad used to have dreams, uh, nightmares of a stallion camel coming at him with his mouth open with these fangs standing out and, and, and clawing. And when he uh, had his vision of the beast of Revelation, as we call it in Christianity, it was the beast of Islam, and it has the limbs, the legs of a camel, long and 20 feet between the joints. Big monstrous thing that will mark all the true believers of Islam, Muhammad. 
These curds are, it's yogurt, it's yogurt gravy, curds and milk. This milk here, we halov, we halov, this is camel's milk. They used to have uh, herds of milk camels, just like you have milk cows. They had milk camels over there. Camels are, camel means what, Sharon, in Hebrew? Gift of God. Gift of God. They looked at a camel as a gift of God because it could go without water and everything for a long time. It didn't take a lot of food. It was a, a, an animal that, that could carry a big burden, more than a horse could, more than a bull or anything like this. This camel is a big creature, and um, if you can tame them, like I said, most of them were not, they were old, were not the stallion camels, the male camels, but the female camels. And they had special breed of female milk ca ca camels. We have beef cattle, and we have milk cattle, don't we? We have uh, Herefords and Black Angus, and we have Holsteins and Guernsey and Jerseys and all of those. These are all different. They are bred for a different thing. These camels here were milk camels, okay, milk camels. We find out later on, as man moved into Europe, that they started breeding cattle in Europe to give milk. And that's why many of the northern Europeans, a lot of their diet was cheese and milk. Cheese and milk. Now, the American Indian over here, on the other hand, we have no enzymes in our body to digest milk. But these people over there use milk. And your body does acclimate to thousands of years of what you eat. You are what you eat, so to speak. So the curds of milk and the son of the herd and this bull calf, which he had prepared, third person master seen or cow perfect, which he had prepared. Now he took this calf and prepared it and cooked it. Now, in 1975 in Damascus, Syria, I was there for nine days, I believe. Long nine days. Stink, smell, food that was horrible. I mean, the water was terrible. Everything was terrible. This is the most backward place that I ever been in the world. Just ridiculous. They're driving. The way they drove over there was crazy. You got on the, you walked down the sidewalk as a pedestrian. But you better watch out because a car might come up on the sidewalk and come by you to go around another car. And that's okay over there. This is okay. And they may pull up on the sidewalk to fix the flat tire. And when they come to an intersection, they blow the horns. They don't have stop lights and stop signs. You just blow your horn, and the guy that blows your horn the loudest and the first, you get, you got the driveway. And I, if you listen to the recordings when I was in Damascus, Syria, you'll hear these... In the middle of the night, honk, 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 eep, honk, you know, all of these honking going on because they come into the intersection and I just happened to be in the second story or third story of this uh, Oriental Palace Hotel in the Damascus, Syria for all these days and day and night you heard this stuff. Which he had prepared and he placed before them literally in the face of them, before their faces. Now, how did they eat, Sharon? How did these people eat? Did they, re they reclined, I think? They reclined. Yeah. Now, here we have, we have people. Now, Abraham had a pallet out here, or maybe a short table, this tall or so, and these guys would lay down on pallets or rugs or whatever, and they would lay up to the table. And they would lay on their left side and eat with their right hand. This is the custom of the day. And they would reach out there, and they would put this meat all out there. They'd put this yogurt out there, and they would put this bread and whatever else they had. Now, we had a maitre d' in this Oriental Palace Hotel, and he came out there, and he had some class. Really, he tried to be classy. He always carried a towel over his arm like this, or like this. And he would shake her hand, and he had this towel over his arm, and he would go out here and seat you and everything. The towel was gray. It was so had been so dirty. Everything had diesel smoke on it. They were cooking the food with diesel, with a diesel stove. 
and some of the stoves that they had, they would have uh, pieces of stone carved out in there, and in the stone they would have a, a, a pot over here with a spigot on it and a, a copper tubing or steel tubing coming down, and it would be dripping down, and they'd light this diesel or stove oil, and it would be burning. And you're smelling this stuff all over, okay? Just smelling all this kerosene. Now, I used to work in the oil fields years ago. And it was so cold out there in the oil fields, sometimes it would be below zero, and we would be out there working. Uh, we would throw chain when we'd make connections. I would, I was a, usually, I was real good at throwing chain, and I'd whip that chain like that. And it's big chain, and it would, and it would pull real hard, and the sparks would just fly on it and spin it up. But when we'd break a connection, and the hot drilling mud would come out, it would freeze right there. It would freeze on the chain, and you could hardly get the chain off the pipe. This is how cold it was, real, real cold. But we would go out there, and we'd take diesel, and we'd take a piece of soft rope, which is a manila rope, and it, they were big ropes like this, and we'd take and coil them up in a, in a bucket, steel bucket, and we'd set it on fire. And we'd stand over this bucket, trying to get warm, putting our hand there so we could work. And this would be up on the uh, drilling rig floor, and we'd stand and be in between and try to warm our hands. And when we get off the ship, shift, our faces and, and our, half our clothes would be black. From the soot. Well, everybody was black over there. That towel was gray. You know, I mean, everything was dark over here. So that's the way they cooked. And back in Abraham's day, now they're cooking with whatever wood they've got. And by the way, they even used bitumen back then, which was tar. Maryland's grandfather, when he lived down in near La Brea, they would go get barrels of tar, and he would put a barrel up by the wood-burning cook stove, and he devised a thing like we're talking about there in the Middle East. He had a trough in an angle iron in his wood-burning cook stove, and he would drip this natural petroleum in there, and it would heat. Of course, boy, all this black smoke's coming out. It put out heat, and it cooked in the stove, but boy, you had to clean that oven and all that out because of this black, but it made a lot of heat. So what did he use? What he used here for fuel, which were many things, because I'll tell you what, there's not a whole lot of timber over in those countries. Died dung. In America, they used buffalo chips. Whatever it was that he cooked this food with, and he brings it there, and this maitre d' comes over there, and we are going to be royalty, he says tonight. We are going to feed you the food that Abraham fed to the angels. You're going to get this dinner. This is what you're going to have. So we sat there, and Brother Madden was sat there beside me, and they brought this tortilla out, just like it was back then. They put meat on top of the tortilla, and Mother Man said, boy, I'm hungry. This is the best looking meal I've had so far. He said, I hadn't had decent food and a cup of coffee in days. You know, like this. And then they pour this camel yogurt gravy on top of it. And he takes that plate of his then. He said, I was hungry. And he sets it on the floor and says, come here, kitty, kitty, kitty. And there were cats running around over there. You don't see any dogs in those countries very often because Muhammad hated dogs. He hated dogs. He can't stand the barking of dogs. So anyway, he said, come here, kitty, kitty, kitty. And I said to him, I said, Brother Madden, you're trying to get us killed. We're in Damascus, Syria. Out there near in, in front of the courthouse with three corpses hanging all the time I was there by the neck. All turned blue and black and everything, and they're just hanging there. Excrement coming out of them, dripping on the ground. We were driving by this in December in Damascus, Syria, and these guys were hanging by the neck there all the time I was there. I guess it was a deterrent to crime to anybody else. Capital punishment is, but there's no telling what they did. And I didn't want to be one of them next. Brother Madden, cool it just a little bit. And he sat down in the face of them, and he, he's standing. Now they're laying up to the table like that, eating like this, and he's standing, waiting on them like the maitre d', okay? Under the tree, under the tree, ha'etz. And they kept on eating. 
they ate and they kept on eating. This is third person, masculine, plural, cal, wow, consecutive, imperfect. Let's go to 8 and verse 9. Are you learning a little bit with this, just a little bit of culture as we go along? Wayomaru, Elah, Ayeh, Sarah, Ishtika, Wayomer, Hine, and then Va'ahel. And they said, now, Wyomer is he said, but now we have Wyomer you here. Wyomer you. Wyomeru, that is. And they said and kept on saying unto him. They're to all talking to him, taking turns. Where, Sarah? Where's the princess? Where is the what, Sharon? Princess means what? Cantankerous one. Where's the cantankerous one? Where is that uh, ornery woman of yours? <laughs> That's what Sarah means. Means to contend. Uh, wife of you, Ishtika, your wife, and he said, Wayomer, uh, third person, master, singer, cow, wow, consecutive, imperfect. Behold, in a intent, intent, not in the tent, but intent. She's she is va. Ah, hell, va a hell, in the tent. 18 and verse 10 now. Wyomer. Shuv. Ah, shuv. Ilika. Kaeth. Haya. Wihene. Vain. Lasaira. Ishtika, we Sarah, Shah Maath, Pitha, Ha Ohel, we Hu, Acharo. And he said and kept on saying, third person masculine, singular, cow, well, consecutive, and perfect. Returning. Now, who do you think this is? This is Jesus talking here. This is the. Uh, this is the pre-incarnate Christ talking. Returning, that's Cal infinitive, uh, absolute. It means to return, literally, to return. I will be returning, or to return. I shall return. First person construct, senior, Cal imperfect. I shall keep on returning. I will going to do this. Elika, unto you. At time, Kaeth, at time, uh, reviving. Reviving. And that is word haya. Uh, time reviving, making alive again. When is the time that everything makes it comes alive again? In the springtime. All right, in the springtime. That's when the calves are born. That's when the goats are born. That's when the, uh, the baby deer are born, the fawns and all of that. This is the time of giving birth. And behold, we have now, and behold, son. To Sarah, your wife, son to Vera, your wife, and Sarah, hearing uh, at door, the tent, we hew, and it behind him. Now she's behind them all in a tent, and she's at the door of the tent. How thick are the tent walls? It's pretty thin, pretty thin. I mean, this is thick cloth, but it's thin. I mean, it's not like two by six walls with insulation that you can hear through. Okay, you can hear through tents easily. We Abraham, we Sarah, Sekanim, Baim, Bayumin, Haadol, Leoth, Lisara, Arach, it's Arach. It kind of like clearing your throat, Arach, and then Kanashim. And Abraham and Sarah, being old, being worn out, being geriatric, uh, old people, Sikanim, geriatric, great in age, advanced by Im, advanced, masculine, plural, cow, participle, ad, uh, being advanced. In days, by Yamim, in days, uh, had ceased, she, uh, 
he had ceased to be to Sarah. In other words, Sarah was not having any more monthly cycles. She is not going to have kids. That's it. She is not going to have children. As it accustomed, like women, she was in men past menopause in all reality. Now, some women can have uh, their monthly cycles even in their 60s sometimes. My uh, great, great, great grandmother had three children in her 50s. Ila Tika Moshok Chu. She was a chicken soul. And so she was having children, but we're not talking about 60s. We're not talking about 70s. We're not talking about 80s. We're talking about old. This woman's old. She's in her 90s. My mother's 92. I can't imagine her having a child today. 8 and verse 12. 18 and verse 12. What sees Huck? Sarah. Bikerba. Limor. Achare. Biliti. Hayatha. Le. Edna. We are deny. Zakan. And uh, she laughed and kept on laughing, Sarah. Inwardly. In herself. In herself. Now, God knows what we feel like in our hearts, don't he? He knows this. We're not hiding anything from God. Laughing in herself, saying. And this hell is uh, Cal Infinitive. Uh, to, to be saying, Lemor, to be saying, after being worn out and having become old, shall become to me Edna pleasure, shall become to me Edna pleasure, and my Lord, and my Lord, old being. After all this happened, I'm going to have pleasure. And she laughed. Here is the word what tit si hak chok. What si chok. And she laughed and kept on laughing. The word laugh. Sharon, what does the word laugh? Yitchik mean. It means to laugh. That's a spontaneous thing. If you get to feeling really bad, go watch Laurel and Hardy and laugh. It'll build up your spirits. It, it's something, it's pleasure. Laughing is pleasure. Kissing is pleasure. Touching is pleasure. These are all things we do. All of this is, come the word, uh, itchik. That's the root of it. Page 850 in Brown, Driver, and Biggs, and 1019 in Kohler and Bumgardner. 18 and verse 13. Wyomer, Wyomer. Hadabar, Hadabar, El Abraham, El Abraham. Lama, Lama, Ze, Ze Tachak, Ta Zara, Zara, Lemor, Haaf, Ha'af, Ha'af. Yu Nam, Nam, Eled, Wa'ani, Wa Sakani, Sakanti. Sakanti. And he said, and kept on saying Jehovah now, this is Hathavar, this is, this is our whole logos, this is Jesus, unto Abraham. Why then she laughed? Laughed. She laughed. She had pleasure. Was she looking forward to pleasure? Was she looking forward to that pleasure? Yes. She's laughing. Sarah saying, The indeed, ha'af, the indeed, certainly, I shall bear, I shall uh, hear, that is, and I am old, I shall bear, and I am old, being become old. I am geriatric. I'm very old, and shall I keep on bearing? Shall I keep on bearing? Well, she's going to bear one time. This is miraculous birth. Okay, we're going to finish at 18 and verse 14. Ha yipale, mi ha davar, davar, la moed, 
Hashub, Elika, Kaet, Haya, Yulisera, Ben. Is the unattainable, unattainable, is the wonderful. And that's third person, master, and senior, nifal, imperfect. This is, is this too wonderful? Is this too miraculous? Is this too uh, uh, fantastic from Jehovah? Has Jehovah? Does Jehovah have any limits? Anything, the bar. This word devar here, it, 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 the, the Greek word is logos. Is there any word, any deed, anything at the season, at this season, this thing, this word, this edict that God has given to them, at the season I shall keep on returning unto you at the time of reviving spring and to Sarah, son and to Terah's son and we'll start on verse number 15 the next time we went from 8 to uh, 8 6 to 14 18 6 to 14 do you have any uh, questions no I just just can't imagine how she was feeling <laughs> hearing this yeah You Can you really do this? Yeah. I mean, you really going to do this? Yeah, I mean, th she's been waiting all this time. Yeah, she's wanted to have a child all this time. She's tried. Time. She even took uh, Pharaoh's daughter, the princess that he was yeah. supposed to have, and gave her to him as a slave, as a concubine, yeah. and not as a wife, yeah. so she could have a child. And we see all of this in God, in his unpreventable progress, and in his permissive will, he lets all kinds of things happen and does all this. This is the only child that Abraham should have had. All the other children that Abraham had, what happened? Well, they, they were the faith line. They were the thorn in the flesh of the faith line, and they still are today, aren't they? They still are today. Anything else? Anything else? Well, let's have a prayer. Let's go out and do something eternal. Our Father, we come to you. We ask you to forgive us for your failure. I pray that this message goes out. It'll lift people up. That they'll understand your word better than ever. They'll see all the avenues that your word is as inspired. Your word is perfect. Every little detail of it, medically, physically, scientifically, mathematically, is perfect and in perfect harmony with the universe that you created. I cannot believe, Father, that you made things that would be imperfect, that you wrote things down in your word that is not true. In Jesus' name I pray, and I ask that there's one out there that don't know you, that they do not know you today, that they will, and that they will believe in your word and in you, and in the only way of salvation, Jesus, our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.